A holistic approach also takes a point of departure in the citizen's own wishes and needs, and hence engage the citizen in the help uh, <clears throat> that they get. So engagement, uh, as uh, Karen Duke will talk about after my presentation, um, <clears throat> is an important part of working uh, with a, a holistic approach. I will not go a lot into that since Karen uh, is doing that. But to give an example, in a drug reducing intervention, professionals not only focus on reduction of drug use, but also take into account uh, other aspects of the citizen's everyday life, including his or her job situation, family and other social rela relations, his or her living situation, economy, and so forth. This often involves cooperation with other services in order to be able to help out uh, the citizen <clears throat> as for example cooperation between social benefit services, educational institutions, public housing associations, mental health services and so forth. And therefore intersectorial uh, cooperation becomes a very important part of how a holistic approach is understood. But one thing is theory. Uh, that a holistic approach is about approaching the complexities of problems, about engagement and intersectorial cooperation. Another thing is, <clears throat> how is it possible to enact or implement a holistic approach in institutional practices? And this will be the focus of the presentation today, not going into uh, fine-tuning a definition of a holistic approach, but rather looking into how can, how can interventions that work with a holistic approach actually uh, enact uh, these kinds of ideas? So I will try and analyze how the same concept is enacted or implemented differently in different interventions, accommodating young drug experienced young people in touch with the criminal justice system. The empirical data for the presentation stems uh, from the Danish part of the EPIC project but the overall uh, findings that I'm presenting could just as well be applied, <coughs> applied to other uh, EPIC uh, countries' uh, interventions that uh, we have heard a bit about uh, this morning also. So, uh, as has been mentioned in the beginning of this uh, seminar, one of the purposes of the EPIC project has been to research how prevention interventions approach and offer help to young people between 14 or 15 to 24, 25 years of age who are both drug experienced and is or have been in contact with the criminal justice system. And we define uh, being in contact with the criminal justice system to include being imprisoned, being in custody, having an electronic tag or being on probation or parole or being in other kinds of interventions as Betsy Tom, community kinds of interventions as Betsy Tom also mentioned this morning. We also define drug use very broadly uh, and it could include uh, any kind of illegal drug use but as Sarah uh, and uh, Franca this morning uh, also showed, cannabis and cocaine uh, turned out to be the most often used drugs uh, by the young people. Uh, we have therefore in Denmark, as well as in the other EPIC countries, looked at different uh, prevention interventions that include drug experienced young people in contact with the criminal justice system. In Denmark, we looked into, um, uh, in, in more detail, into two interventions. One intervention is a custody prison based pre treatment program aimed at uh, creating. Uh, and improving inmates' motivation to continue drug treatment, and they have received their sen uh, after they have received their sentence, either in prison or <coughs> in freedom. And uh, we have a uh, one of the cooperate uh, or one of the partners we have um, worked together with, Cecilia, is here today, and she will tell more about this particular intervention uh, after in the panel debate after uh, our two presentations here. The other intervention is a community-based social program with a focus on vulnerable citizens with a broad range of problems or challenges, including young people uh, with drug use experiences uh, and offending behavior. Both interventions work explicitly with a holistic approach. So focusing on two interventions that are aimed at the same target group but offered in different contexts, the prison service and in the community respectively, 
makes a case for studying how a holistic approach is enacted in welfare institutional practices. So the data we draw on for um, this presentation um, is in addition to policies and formal descriptions of the two interventions, qualitative in-depth interviews, as well as explorative group interviews with professionals from the two interventions. So while the two interventions are organizationally and structurally very different, both interventions work with a holistic approach, as just mentioned, and they also have a very similar understanding of the young people, their problems, and how interventions uh, should approach these young people and their problems. So the professionals in both interventions talked about uh, the young people as citizens with complex problems. For example, did their target group have problems with both drug use and offending? <clears throat> but they also described that their target group could have further problems, uh, for example, with homelessness, unemployment, lack of education, problematic family relations or mental health uh, problems. They therefore also emphasized that because of these multiple or complex problems, their target group needed help not from one, but from different kinds of services at the same time. The professionals in both interventions all point to intersectorial cooperation as a very important part of a holistic approach. This included uh, getting the young person enrolled in relevant services, but also to get the dif different welfare services to cooperate in order for the help to be coordinated and hence more efficient uh, for the young person. Since they also saw the Danish welfare system as complex and difficult to navigate within, intersectorial cooperation became <clears throat> even more urgent for the professionals, uh, as I will show. And even though these data stem from the Danish part of EPIC, uh, as I said, uh, I think there are similar findings in several of the other EPIC uh, uh, countries. So in the following, I will give one example that revolves around how professionals uh, describe their intersectorial efforts uh, with or for uh, the young people as part of ena enacting a holistic approach. We will see that these efforts are described in quite different ways, and our argument is that, difference, that these differences are due to different organizational uh, and structural conditions that the two interventions uh, have. In general, professionals in the prison-based intervention uh, talked about intersectorial cooperation as bridge building or paving the way uh, for the young person. Their aims are, in other words, to create pathways uh, for their participants uh, to enter other welfare services in the, ho in the home municipality of the young person when they come out of the custody uh, <coughs> prison or in other prison services if the young person is transfer transferred after custody uh, to a prison. So these professionals thus make connections uh, for the client to other services. As an example, one of the professionals in the prison-based intervention says, every time a client is transferred, I contact the drug treatment intervention, either in another prison or in the community. In the community, it is more difficult. We give the contact details to the participant, the young person, uh, and often call and see whether he showed up. Um, <clears throat> occasionally, we also help set up a meeting. But in the end, it's up to the young person to get in contact with, particular, with, the, with the particular service if he wants to continue in drug treatment. So as this quote suggests, the professionals cooperate with other welfare uh, institutions on behalf of the young person. It is the professional that makes the phone calls and write the emails uh, while the young person has to remain in his cell. Intersectorial efforts are, however, done quite differently in the community-based intervention. Here professionals enact intersectorial cooperation by walking the steps together with the young person and by learning them how to manage or handle the welfare systems. Professionals see themselves as mentors uh, and lay representatives for the young person. They accompany them to the meetings and appointments they might have 
and as such scaffold their way around the system instead of building bridges uh, for them. As an example, one of the professionals in the community-based interventions uh, says, we help the citizens to walk the steps, make the phone calls and set up a meeting with a social worker uh, or the doctor or set up a network meeting with relevant professionals from different systems. Get a good, co get a good operation going and help our participant uh, to get on from there. We don't do it for them, but walk the steps together with them. One day they will be able to do it themselves. The different organizational uh, and structural conditions of the two interventions, of which one being based within the prison service and the other in, co in the community, is a, a very important difference. For professionals in the prison-based intervention, it is not possible uh, to walk the steps with their participants since they are in prison. So even if they wanted, certain enactments of an intersectorial effort are not possible due to these organizational and structural uh, conditions. So here is just to give an overview of, over uh, the differences. Like in the prison-based intervention, they talk about bridge building, creating pathways. Uh, they talk about um, <coughs> professionals work on behalf of the young persons. They talk about make connections for the young person to other welfare systems. And in the community-based intervention, they talk about being co-navigators, mentors, scaffolders. Uh, the professionals work together with the young uh, persons. And they try to teach the young person to navigate uh, <coughs> the welfare systems themselves. So by drawing on welfare institutional research that focus on how welfare services are not neutral problem solvers, but also how they, as part of addressing these issues, which the citizen uh, needs help to handle, are constructing institutional identities. We can see that our two interventions under scrutiny here construct different kinds of institutional identities or subject positions uh, for their uh, participants. In the community-based intervention, uh, they construct subject positions or institutional identities as apprentices that need support and time to learn. Uh, and in the <coughs> prison-based intervention, they sort of operate with a two-faced uh, subject. Within the remand prison system, participants are deprived agency, but after release, participants are expected to have agency and be able to act uh, on their own. Uh, behalf. So, depending on how it's possible to do intersectorial work, we also construct different kinds of uh, <coughs> institutional or identities for our young participants or, or, or the young people. And then, and it, the, the important thing is that we then expect different things for them. And uh, and I think I'll get back to that, but that's important to be uh, aware of. So another line of welfare institutional research revolves around the observation that uh, welfare services have difficulties uh, with handling complex problems and that the problem understandings and solutions of these various services do not necessarily match. So despite the fact that welfare institutions in Denmark on a national level answer to the same overall laws and policies, for example being obliged to provide holistic solutions, to citizens, that varying institutional setups mean that these solutions are possibly enacted in very different ways. Such var variations, for example, in the form of organizational structure, institutional values, and wider institutional embedding, enable different and not necessarily congruent enactments of, for example, a holistic approach. Especially the observation that solutions not necessarily match when applying intersectorial cooperation between different welfare services and that welfare services answer to the same national laws and policies but possibly also to different laws and policies were emphasized as a challenge in the interviews with the professionals. When enacting inter intersectorial cooperation uh, with other welfare services, the professionals experienced a hierarchy in the cooperation 
where some legal conditions and or institutional values took precedence to their own. So <clears throat> one professional from the community-based intervention, for example, says, they are tough in the prison ser service. He is on parole with an electronic tag. He got a chance to serve his sentence on milder conditions, but this means no drugs and, no neg or and negative urine tests. If not, he will be sent back to prison. But they don't ask why he uses drug, uh, as, they, as is the case in drug treatment. They don't focus on cooperating with us, for example, or with the drug treatment services. When he got the electronic tag off, he was back on drugs. So we see it as our job to facilitate cooperation between drug treatment services, the prison service, and the young person. So the quote suggests that the prison services rules and regulations on zero tolerance toward, uh, towards drug use take precedence over the drug treatments ideas of abstaining um, <coughs> from drug use as a process where reduction of drug use is seen as just as important a step to make as abstinence. So, concluding remarks. Uh, a holistic approach is enacted differently in different institutional contexts and setups. I have focused in particular on intersectorial uh, cooperation as an important part of a holistic approach. So just to remind you, engagement is also an important part, as we will hear in a minute from Karen. Uh, enactments of intersectorial cooperation, however, uh, constructs different kinds of client-subject positions, as we saw. I have also argued that intersectorial cooperation often is based on a hierarchical relation between services, uh, where one service's set of uh, rules takes precedence uh, over the others, other services. Often it's the criminal justice system rules and regulations that takes precedence over, uh, for example, different kinds of uh, drug treatment or drug prevention interventions, rules or ideas of, of how uh, people can reduce their drug use. And these conditions, as well as others, have implication for pre prevention. So we encourage more focus on how interventions constructs client positions. This is important in relation to what we expect of the young uh, person enrolled in an intervention and we encourage more focus on how the relationship between services who has to cooperate in order to help out young people with complex problems are defined. It has implications for the way these kinds of cooperations work and in the end what the outcome for the young person uh, is in terms of help. And just very uh, <coughs> briefly as the last slide if you want to read more, uh, we have written an article in Drugs and Alcohol Today, and it is actually an open access um, article, so it's uh, free for download. Um, yes, and that's all for me now. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. And uh, excellent that you have an open access article. That's a great movement, isn't it? To, uh, increase uh, the uh, impact of research. So we move now to Karen Duke, who is going to talk about the engagement or engaging young people in interventions. Karen is a professor of criminology here at Middlesex, and she's also one of the editors-in-chief of the journal Drugs, Education, Prevention and Policy, and she's been with Betsy Tom, uh, one of the co-principal um, investigators of this, of this project. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge this paper's collaborators, um, Helen Gleason, who I think is here today, um, Maria Harold um, from Denmark, who unfortunately can't be here, Sarah Rolando, who you heard from earlier, and Katja Dabrowski as well, who's here today. Um, Engagement or how to engage young people in drug interventions became a very important theme as we went through the research. Um, and this was across the six countries. And I think what's 
nice about this is despite the differences in the criminal justice system um, and the way in which drug interventions are um, structured, there were actually remarkable similarities um, in the ways in which practitioners and young people um, spoke about what effective engagement looks like. In the UK, we also conducted four solution-focused workshops. Um, and these took place in Edinburgh, uh, Sheffield, Sandwell, and London. And some of the practitioners that facilitated those for us um, and took part are here in the audience today. And we produced this um, small report, which is in your, um, your pack. So have a, have a look at that if you're interested. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to look briefly at the way in which engagement has been conceptualized and defined. And then what I want to do is I want to share our findings from the research and highlight some of the key themes um, that were coming out um, from our interviews with young people and practitioners across the six <laughs> countries. So just as a way of background, um, what was surprising to me is that this is quite a neglected area in youth justice and in the drugs field. And it's mainly understood from the point of view of the professional or practitioner and not from the point of view of, of the young person. If we look at the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989, um, you know, youth participation or engagement is an ethical imperative. Um, it's a fundamental democratic uh, right. But when we started to look at what happens in national law and, and in policies, um, it was very patchy um, and not universally applied. And this was particularly the case when we look at young people in the criminal justice system. Um, so there's clear challenges relating to engagement of what we call involuntary clients, so people that aren't coming into service on a voluntary basis, but in many ways might be referred via the criminal justice system. So from our literature review, we found sort of multiple definitions of engagement coming out from social work, education, health, uh, youth justice. And some of these focus very narrowly on in, uh, sort of, you know, behavioral measures like enrollment or attendance, getting somebody into a service, making sure they attend each week, tick box, tick box, tick box, that kind of thing. But others take a much broader perspective um, and they, they emphasize the sort of active participation, um, the motivation and the commitment um, of the young people, which most of these um, do, actually all of them do. So through the research, what we did is we identified um, two levels of engagement. So the first one is called operational engagement. Um, and this is really about the one-to-one -one relationship between the practitioner and the young person. Um, and it operates at the micro level. It's an individual relationship. It's the interactions between those two people. And we also identified what we called organized, organizational engagement. And this is about involving young people in the development of services and their delivery, ensuring that their views are heard, that their voices are heard and taken on board. Um, and at its sort of highest level, what this could mean is actually um, involving young people and practitioners in co-producing interventions. And again, this looks very much at the sort of macro level, at the, at the, at the structural level of, of, of services and interventions. So in order to look at that operational level, um, this is the one-to-one -one relationship between the practitioner and the young person, we drew on a framework put forward by Smith and Gray in 2018. And what they did is they identified three styles of working with young people in contact with the criminal justice system. So the first one is the offender management model. And here the emphasis is on dealing with offending, um, dealing with managing risk, uh, reducing reoffending, reducing drug use, um, and sort of managing people through the system. Addressing welfare needs here are actually conflated with risk. Um, so they're not so concerned about, you know, what are the reasons young people are using drugs or what are the reasons they're offending? It's about sort of just getting them through the system. So the second model that they identified was the targeted intervention model. And these are aimed only at young people who offend, so only people that are caught up in the criminal justice system. But it's integrated with wider services, so you've got health and housing and substance use and education. And here, the aim is to identify those with the greatest needs and also the greatest risk. 
Um, and the priority, of course, is, is prevention work. So preventing um, offending, preventing reoffending, preventing drug use, and preventing the escalation of, of substance use. So the third model is the children and young people first model. And here the priority is on the well-being of, of the young person. So there's a de-emphasis on the offending behavior. So it's seeing that person as a young person, not as a drug user, not as an offender. And the aim here is to create generic, um, holistic youth support systems. And this is really echoing what Vivica was saying about this holistic approach. Um, and this model was developed by Stephen Case and Kevin Haynes um, from Swansea University. They were, at the time they were there. Um, and it's become known as the Swansea model of, of youth justice. And I think it's really important to point out that there's no pure versions of these models. Um, when you look at interventions and you talk to practitioners, it's overlapping and blended. Um, so to look at this other level of engagement, organizational um, engagement, we drew on Hart's ladder of youth participation. And he put this together in 1992 for uh, UNICEF. Um, and it draws on Shelley Arnstein's ladder, her, her classic ladder, if everybody knows that, of community development, um, of, of citizen participation. So he, he's adapted it for young people. Um, and what he did is he developed this hierarchy of, of, of participation. On the lower rungs of the, of the ladder, the young people, they're, they're, they're not really initiating, they're not doing anything, they're, they're not really participating at all. We often call this tokenism. Um, and there's no real opportunity for them to make a contribution. If we look up at the higher rungs of the ladder, um, this is where young people have a bit more power, they might be initiating, they might be leading interventions, they might be sharing in decision making. And I think it's obviously this model is quite old now and it's been subjected to a lot of critique. Um, the model assumes that youth are, are, are you know, sort of homogeneous um, and they're not. Um, when we look at this group, our target group, their exclusion and, and marginalization um, really shapes how they can participate and how they can engage. Um, and their participation might be more dynamic, it might be you know, unpredictable, it might shift over time, and it might depend on context. So what we do is we draw on these models um, to explore the ways in which operational and organizational engagement is viewed by young people and also by the practitioners. So I want to focus first on operational um, engagement. And across all of the countries that we studied, the young people emphasize the importance of practitioners' attitudes um, and their approach in encouraging engagement. And this gen is generally reflected in the young person first model that, that I've just presented. Um, they emphasize the importance of, of developing a relationship um, based on trust and creating a very calm setting um, for engagement. And this is really illustrated by the first quote by the, the Danish young person. You know, he says, the practitioner started out by trusting me, and that calmed me. So trust is, is, a, is a fundamental part of this. The other um, issue that they raised is, is using non-judgmental language was really important to the young people. Avoiding sort of labeling um, and stigmatizing language, using things like, you know, you're a bad, or you're a failure, or you're an addict. To, to, to avoid using that when describing the young people. And this is really illustrated by the second quotes. The young person from the UK is saying, you know, the practitioners are great, they encourage you, they never tell you you're a bad person. And again, the young person from Italy um, saying, you know, this person looked at me differently, she did not look for an addict. So again, it just underlines the importance of, of using non-labeling non language. Um, most of you in the room are thinking, well, yeah, this, this is an obvious finding. It's not surprising at all. It isn't surprising. This is what we should be doing. Um, but I think what it, the importance of this is that it, uh, we need to allow time for these relationships to develop. And often in services, we, you know, people have got six sessions or 12 sessions or eight sessions, and they have to process this person through the system, and they, they don't have the opportunity to develop this type of relationship. Or it makes it very difficult. Um, the practitioners also stress the importance of the relationship and addressing complex issues. And again, echoing your, your presentation, Vivica, um, you know, there was a recognition of the multiple issues faced by young people in the criminal justice system. 
and the need to address other issues besides substance use and offending. So it might mean that somebody needs a, you know, a house. Homelessness might be their first and foremost problem. The substance use is way down the, the line. And again, this, this points to this um, holistic approach. Um, so the first quote from um, the <coughs> practitioner in Denmark, um, she's saying, you know, I, I see the young people. I want to see them. I don't want to place them in a box or a category. Focusing on the sum rather than the parts. And again, another practitioner in Italy saying, you know, it's about taking care of the person. It's about the therapeutic relationship. So again, stressing interagency working as well, that you have to connect with other services. Young people um, felt that trust and bonding was seen to be facilitated when practitioners had lived experience um, of substance use for the criminal justice system. And they felt that the information coming from these types of people was much more credible and accurate and relevant. Um, so the use of peer workers, the use of, of peer mentors was seen to be very valuable um, by the young people. They were seen to have a sort of sense of relatability. But when we talked to the practitioners, there was a slight resistance um, to the idea of peer workers or of the idea of peer workers doing everything. They stressed the need to have proper training, to have proper support for these young people who were acting as peer mentors because of the complex problems that the young people presented with. And what they suggested is that peer workers could work alongside traditional practitioners, but they needed to be supported and they needed to be trained. Another key finding um, across all of the countries is that the, the young people spoke about the desire to have control. So control about the pace at which they were asked to disclose things, but also control about the goals um, that were being set for them. And this was clearly echoed by the practitioners. Um, and they argued that the relationships needed to be collaborative, that the young people needed to be active partners um, within that process. And again, this links to this young person first model. The practitioners um, talked about how they often feel very constrained by managerial processes and targets. Um, and they, they kept on stressing, we need autonomy, we need flexibility to work with young people in the way that will work for them. So being adaptable and not being dictated by processes and procedures. Um, so this was uh, the idea that they needed to be deliver, uh, they needed to be able to deliver um, individualized um, interventions. So it was very much a, a rejection of that offender management model, where you're constantly assessing risk and that sort of thing. And linked to sort of flexibility and autonomy um, was particularly important when we looked at substance use and the way in which that was dealt with. For some young people, um, drug prevention had to include harm reduction approaches um, that might be about just reducing use or cutting down on use um, or not engaging in maybe harmful forms of, of poly drug use um, and be, being careful how substances are being mixed together. It might be about warning them about how to use drugs safely in different settings. So I can remember very clearly one of the UK practitioners said, you know, we'll tell them not to smoke cannabis on the way to school because they go in, they smell like cannabis, they're you know, going to get searched, they're going to get nicked, and then the, the police is, is involved. So it, this idea about sort of thinking about their, their, the situation of, of their drug use and the setting of their drug use. Um, and the practitioners and the young people felt that engagement or having that really good relationship was often hindered by a strict adherence to an abstinence-based approach. So practitioners, again, they need this flexibility um, to deliver approaches and deliver interventions um, in ways that suit the young people that are, are in front of them. For young people that were adamant that they would you know, not quit using drugs, there needed to be a space um, for them to explore what safer substance use um, might look like. And they felt that this would um, lead to, to more positive engagement um, in the interventions. Um, as Yatsik has already um, sort of spoken about, there's these systemic issues um, and the criminal justice context um, was seen to have sort of a detrimental impact on creating these trusting and honest relationships uh, between the practitioners and the young people. Um, there could be conflicts between the health and the criminal justice approaches, 
problems around interagency working, um, and again, this, this need for sort of flexibility and autonomy comes through very strongly in terms of the goals of intervention and being able to work with harm reduction in that criminal justice setting. Um, there was particular difficulties that were mentioned around confidentiality and information sharing um, between substance use workers and, and the criminal justice system um, professionals. And this was seen to have a real negative impact um, on engagement and how much the young person was willing to share with the practitioners. So, you know, they, they didn't want to disclose too much because they fear that they're going to be punished, that they're going to have additional sanctions, um, or that they might be, you know, the subject of increased surveillance. So very wary of criminal justice. Just briefly, um, thinking about now organizational engagement. In the different countries, most interventions that we looked at did not involve young people in the design and implementation of the service of the intervention. So if we look at Hart's Ladder, um, the interventions fit somewhere between four and six mainly. Um, you know, where young people at level four are assigned but not informed, and up to level six where they're adult initiated but we're sharing decisions with the young people. Um, and although involving young people in the design and the delivery of interventions was something that many practitioners talked about and they wanted to do this, um, they were aiming for this, there was difficulties around this um, with involving um, this, this target group. Um, many of them felt that they weren't ready to take on those roles um, due to the complex problems that they might face or that they were facing. Um, they didn't have the space or the time um, actually to get involved in those activities. Um, and that, I, I'm, what I'm, I'm not arguing they shouldn't be involved. I'm saying that that doesn't, you know, we need to look at ways that we can, we can involve them. Um, and their participation in this sort of level of organizational engagement might be possible after, um, you know, they finished with the service or something like that. But first and foremost, their problems needed to be um, dealt with. Am I okay for time, Susan? Yeah. Um, so just some quick conclusions here. Um, so in all the countries, um, the importance of um, the trust and collaborative relationship was a central tenet of engagement. Um, engaging and effective interventions were seen to follow this young person first model, where young people are treated like young people, where they're not treated um, as offenders or, or drug users and this holistic approach um, are put in place to address multiple needs that they may have. We know that the criminal justice context often mitigates um, against this young person first model um, and limits interventions. Uh, there's a tension all the time with the offender management model, um, which is focused on assessing risk um, and processing young people through um, the system. So techniques of good engagement include offering young people more control so that they feel in control of what's happening to them, using harm reduction approaches where that's possible and where appropriate, and creating goals collaboratively with that young person. <clears throat> but practitioners need some flexibility and autonomy um, to work um, you know, with young people the way they want to work with them, the way they see fit, basically. Um, and they need to be able to work with them rather than on them. <laughs> Um, in terms of organizational engagement, there's a need to explore more ways of involving um, young people in the development of interventions and programs. We need to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, and more work needs to be done in this space, especially when we're working with, it, with our target group. So these two levels of engagement have the potential really to interface and, and sort of complement and reinforce um, one another. And it might be that good operational engagement um, is one of the key sort of prerequisites um, for higher levels of, of organizational engagement. Thanks very much for listening. So, two very fascinating presentations. And what we're going to do now is hear from some uh, practitioners who will draw out the implications of these and talk about their services. So if the people who um, have volunteered to be on the panel would like to come uh, to the front and then we will round it off by going back to Karen and Vileka to see how, um, how the reality of the, what the real world links to the 
Agency, voluntary sector agency. Um, Can you all speak up? Because although there are microphones, yeah. it's not picking up very well. Try speaking a little bit louder, and <coughs> if not, we'll use it. Okay, yeah. sorry, I've got the. No, of course, <laughs> everybody's <laughs> suffering. But it's a general point. shouting. <laughs> it's a general point. Um, yeah, so we work with uh, young people uh, in a community setting, um, very much along the lines of engagement and relationship building, and we have a holistic approach. So we look at sexual health, uh, emotional health, mental health physical health and risk-taking behaviour, um, so that's, that's me. So I'm Esme Jollett and I'm a frontline practitioner based in a youth offending team as part of a specialist engagement team of um, health professionals uh, and other community professionals and I work on behalf of CGL. Um, I do a disservice to explain all the contracts we run but we're like a leading provider of young people and adult services and substance misuse. Hi, I'm John. Um, I'm team manager for an organisation called DECA, Drug Education, Counselling and Confidential Advice. We're a young people's drug and alcohol service uh, based in Sandwell, which is one of the four black country boroughs. And essentially we do everything from prevention in schools all the way to working with young people in treatments, including that middle ground of those more disaffected and hard to reach that aren't currently using substances but are on the peripheries of or involved in some way. So well, we've heard about um, we've heard about holistic approaches. So perhaps you could um, you could tell us that you don't all have to answer or pick up on all of these things. But someone, one of you, wants to talk about holistic approaches um, and how that concept fits or matches or does not with with your work. Who would like to start on that? Do you like to? Yes, I, I start, but uh, I read my speech. Okay. I'm sorry because yes. my English is not so fluently, That's and right. I have to Would slide you like to for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. From here. Okay. Okay. First of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to participate to the important discussion. Thanks uh, to the organizer, organizers and uh, the Italian team, uh, Franca and uh, Sara. This one done. Okay. Okay. Just do that. Okay. okay. I start to read. As uh, shown by my poster, Spazio Blue is the public health service in Milan that since 2000 takes care of juveniles who use drugs and have committed crimes. We attempt to overcome the prejudices and the stigma still attached to traditional public addition treatment services. This is why we have created a specific service for young people, that is minors of young adults up to 25 years if the offenses occur when they were less than 18 years old. Our group is composed of a multidisciplinary and professional team including psychologists, social workers, educators, a psychiatrist, a nurse and a criminologist. 
The most innovative and important aspect of our intervention concerns its timing. Differently from what usually happens, the psychologist meets the underage offender before he meets the judge. Currently, a juvenile offender who is arrested for blatantly apparent crime and is arrested on the spot is sent to a place called Centro di Prima Accoglienza, First Reception Center, that is different from a jail and similar to a community. The juvenile can be detained for up to 96 hours and will be interviewed by a judge. The judge has to decide which precautionary measures apply mandatory to month attendance to, for instance, school, psychological therapy, toxicological screening and prescribed cover fee. House arrest, confinement in a, to an educational community or to a therapeutic community where there is a diagnosis of addition to substances. Pre-trial detention in prison. Within these critical 96 hours, a psychologist of our team asks to the young offender whether or not he is willing to discuss about his drug use with us. We inform him or her that the content of the interview and the decision to attend our service will be provided in a written report addressed to the judge. This is information is important for the judge to decide which precautionary measures to use. The psychological interview is characterized by a no judgment assessment that attempts to make sure that the contact of the minors with the justice system can become an opportunity to reflect upon their use of drugs and the offending behaviors which are often related. During the interview, psychologists also provide young people information about the organization of the service, the motivation of the interview and the aim of our intervention which is to increase the awareness. Despite the specific circumstances, we attend to engage the patients in their own rehabilitation or treatment process. How is this done? We try to make the minors the protagonist to their path, engaging them from the beginning and holding them responsible for it. For instance, Instance, this is one of the few cases where minors can sign the consent to treatment and can access to health service even without their parents' consent. We think this is the key factor to get a potentially successful outcome. The treatment path consists of individual counseling per group and parents' group. Educational, um, educational groups meet, meet every week and focus on sharing of experiences and feelings relating to legal issues and treatment. In this way, our young clients become responsible and develop a sense of adult judgment. In the end, they pave their own path and they are able to care about themselves. We like to say, aver cura prima della cura, which in Italian means take care before treating. Okay, thank you for your attention. And, uh, the typical Italian mother. Does <laughs> 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 anyone else want to, make, to go to the podium and give a presentation? Yes? holistic approach but uh, in the conversations we uh, we talk about the whole life uh, these young people that we uh, we're talking to and we don't see their 
drug abuse or the drug use uh, as isolated from their, their whole life. But some of the difficulties that we are facing is that we aren't in the context, we are in the prison and they are, they are maybe some of them for years, so it's sometimes it's difficult to talk about the whole life because we are actually outside the whole life. Um, just to say a little bit about, more about these difficulties. Uh, unknown imprisonment time is one of them. We don't know for how long they're going to be there. Uh, maybe they're there next week, maybe they're not. So that's one of the things. I'll comment on how we try to work with these difficulties later. Uh, then there's this hidden agenda. Uh, sometimes we experience that these young people have a hidden agenda to go into drug treatment or to, uh, to talk to us counselors. Um, in a prison, security always comes first. That's, that's, um, then some of the difficulties that we see a lot of uh, to, get, uh, to work with this holistic approach is that it's difficult for us to get through to municipal treatment. Um, and also that they are released uh, to later imprisonment. So it's difficult to get in contact with the uh, municipal outside the prison. And then we have this thing in Denmark, I actually don't know if it's a thing anywhere else, but we have anonymous treatment for people under the age of 25. Um, so it's difficult for us to help them into this because they, they, they have the opportunity to be anonymous. Yeah. The first one, how do we work around these difficulties? Um, it's important to finish each session properly. I don't know if I see this young man next week, so every time that I leave his room or his cell, uh, I have to make sure that it's okay that I maybe don't see him next week. Um, yeah. Then this thing with the hidden agenda, and we just actually we discussed this a lot in in Denmark, and uh, in our work we we try to talk about that motivation can arise from different things. So maybe their motivation to go into drug treatment or to talk to me is that. It's nice to have someone to talk to when you're alone in your room 23 hours a day. Um, I try to see that just as a, an opportunity for me to talk to them. Maybe it's not their motivation to get into drug treatment, but just, just to talk to me. But I have the opportunity to uh, maybe plant a thought in their mind and maybe <coughs> present that drug treatment uh, isn't what they expected, and maybe along the way they they get another motivation to get into the treatment. Yeah. Then there's this thing about security always comes first. Uh, it's a prison, and uh, it's a condition. But we uh, we try to challenge this uh, whenever it's possible. Uh, sometimes security just is the thing, and we just have to say, yeah, okay. But but we we try to to talk about this, to maybe talk about uh, these young people in another way um, with the officers and that security. Maybe sometimes we also need to give them an opportunity to show something else. So yeah. Then this thing, and I think actually that's a little bit about what Vivica said as well, <coughs> that we try to um, build bridges. Um, we do this because we don't have Actually, we don't have another opportunity. But this difficulty to get through to municipal treatment, and maybe that they're released from us, we try to talk to them about how do you get in contact with treatment outside. And it's down to basic line, how do you pick up the phone, what do you say, how do you ring, what's the number, when do you do it, where do you go, uh, how do you go from your home to there. So it's like the basic, we do our best to prepare them, because we can't go with them. It's not an opportunity for us. And then there's this thing about anonymous treatment. It's a good condition as well as the security, and sometimes I actually think it's also it's a positive thing. 
when we work with these persons who are young, they are often they are who's going to see this, what's going to be written down, uh, what consequence does this have? So actually, it's a positive thing that you can say, but you could go to anonymous. It, you, your name doesn't have to show anywhere, but but still, it's <laughs> difficult for us to help them because it is anonymous. So yeah, that was it for me. <laughs> Um, I don't have a presentation, uh -huh. so if that's okay, I'll sit here. But um, we we are offering um, more preventative, more preventative services, so young people can um, contact our service. It's all voluntary. We don't have any kind of um, coerced attendance, which I think is a, a real benefit to us. Um, we can also offer confidentiality in the same way. Um, but before, the most important thing for us is about it being relational. So there's something around, um, so our agency is trying to uh, develop our trauma-informed practice because most of the young people we work with who are using substances problematically are, have experienced um, early adversity or trauma. And we know that um, you need to take a relational approach if you're going to be working with trauma. So for us, it's all about that engagement, um, very much about um, taking the young person as a young person, their whole life, um, talking about you know what they like, the music they like, connecting with them first before we start you know um, trying to help them with drug use or sexual health or physical health, and we have a variety of pathways that young people can come in. So from drop-in services, they can refer themselves, they can be referred. Um, they might see us in their schools or in their community, so they start to think about us when they're in a crisis situation. So we're, we're looking at forming relationships before things get difficult. Um, and I guess the other thing would be uh, similar to the, the Danish thing where you're really trying to work in partnership with other agencies, so we can't do everything ourselves. Um, we rely a lot on schools who are in our area. Um, Young People's Units and Edinburgh Secure Services to um, be highlighting to us young people who might be needing a little bit of additional support. And then at, at certain points we can then offer something a little bit more intensive, so therapeutic services, one-to-one um, -one or group work. Um, and we're, we never deal with the single issue of substance use, we're always dealing with the whole complex range, range of issues, um, early trauma, um, relationships, families, being in care, um, culture in Scotland is quite a, um, an interesting culture around alcohol and drugs. So yeah, it's always a complex thing and we're always sort of treated in that way. Um, and we start with what the young people want to start with. So in a way that makes our job easier. You know, they might be referred by the teachers for a range of difficult, um, difficult behaviours, for example. But if the young people don't want to address that, we will not address that. Um, and we're not, you know, they can continue to use substances and we'll still be talking to them about their emotional health, we'll still be supporting them in the work that we do. So, um, yeah, that, that's the kind of approach that we're taking in our community based. Um, and, and again, focused on um, areas of poverty and inequality, because for us, I think that is really key in terms of substance use and, and why people, I mean, not always, um, you know, plenty of middle class people will take drugs and um, you know have fun and party, but um, for us it's very much about um, inequality and health inequality and trying to sort of redress some of that um, in the work that we do. So uh, yeah, relationships, relationships, connection, engagement, relationships. <laughs> so that's me. Huh? Do you want to go there or do you want to speak here? Um, I'm, this is going to make, well I hope it makes people laugh. I've prepared for question two. <laughs> So is that all right to talk around? Yes, or do you want me to do. Talk around no, again? do. So that was based on innovations that we've shown in our service. Um, I'm going to make a couple of apologies first before I start as well. So I've come back from this isn't name dropping. I've come back from Australia about two days ago. So apparently I've got a really dodgy accent. 
and extreme jet lag. So there's lots of <laughs> that's I'm not usually that way. You should probably worry that I've got the ability to work with young people. Never mind, I can explain to you. All. <laughs> so <laughs> when a young person comes into contact with the criminal justice service in Sheffield, or I'm the sole practitioner who would kind of look after them and around their substance use needs. Um, some of the innovation I showed when I sort of took on that role was approaching kind of practitioners within the youth justice service in Sheffield, which is very fortunate. It's a very integrated service, so it's got every single young person service that you could imagine in one building. We all talk to each other, we all know each other on any kind of friendly, personal levels. We all work with the same, you know, we do kind of group interventions with the young people. So I had a real opportunity there to kind of ask uh, practitioners in the youth justice service about what else or what more could a substance misuse service offer young people uh, that maybe primarily uh, substance, oh, this is the, yeah, substance use was an issue for them but it wasn't the most pressing issue in their lives. So yes, they were smoking <coughs> uh, cannabis maybe two to three times a week and we can give them sort of advice around, you know, don't, hop, don't hold cannabis in your lungs and don't hot box and yeah, don't smoke it on the way to school. But actually, you know, the previous night they'd had a, a machete held to their throat and they had 36 wraps of cocaine and heroin back in their property. They shared with mum and dad and they were worried that they were going to get thrown out and evicted. So it's these young people that were quite boundaried around their substance misuse and weren't in a pattern of problematic or kind of chaotic use that really needed something more from our service that sort of wasn't being provided. And there was a real appetite in youth justice to explore more than the kind of the legal context that they had time to explore. So often um, the courts were kind of dictating as a substance misuse service what they wanted us to take on, working with kind of a gang involved young person. And it might be, I want you to explore the community, the impact on communities of this young person's drug dealing behaviour. Um, but something kind of that I thought about is how can we address victimisation um, that a young person's caused to kind of often unknown victims before we primarily look at the victimisation that they're facing day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, um, involved as a drug dealer. Especially, I don't know if it, in, uh, international candidates have come in today, the issue of county lines in the UK. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to explain that in like another four minutes. So. <laughs> but that's what we're dealing with, very serious organised crime and young people that were being um, trafficked all over the country or whether it was just door to door. Um, so I developed um, very, very heavily informed by the voices of young people. I wanted to see if there was even an appetite to explore those things with young people um, about kind of their mindset, about their identity, about the realities that they faced um, as dealers on the streets, about the life changes that co um, was kind of costing them, about the kind of the things they were actually getting out of that um, lifestyle, kind of the dividends, why they stayed involved, why things escalated for them. Um, and, and that kind of helped youth justice in a sense manage, like more effectively kind of manage um, safeguarding issues and risk and gave them that trusting relationship and space to explore things. Um, and as part of kind of that process it was okay, so if young people have told me how things are, um, now how can we kind of share that and educate professionals on the front line who often experience a lot of anxiety managing the level of risk that they have to do as frontline practitioners. So I think Karen came to some training around called What's the Deal? And that was trying to kind of um, give uh, frontline professionals a, a full day to kind of explore um, the current context of dealing in the UK and uh, what young, people, young people's views are about why they get involved and why they're trapped and why they can't get out. Um, but again, I'm, I don't have lived experience of the issues, but it was just too much of a pressing issue as a frontline practitioner to ignore what was going on in those young people's lives. Um, and we've had some of the best levels of engagement we've ever had of young people who were labelled before we'd started working with them as hard to reach. Um, it was just because there wasn't anything relevant and interesting to explore with them. So that's, that's where we're at in our service. Um. For me, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how I feel that Epic has had a bit of an impact on our service, essentially. And it hasn't necessarily changed anything fundamentally, but what it's done is it's given me as the manager, and I think as the workers themselves, more confidence. Because we've been saying now since we can remember, the importance of building relationships with our clients and our young people. 
and we're in a Samuel Children's Trust, basically. So essentially, we part of the local authority. And they have statutory responsibilities. They need to do a certain number of things. We very much feel as though, unless you've got that bond with that young person, realistically, the work that you then do is going to be compromised. Uh, we're working with young people that have been involved in services for two, three, five years, longer in certain cases, that are disclosing to us more on the first and second appointment than they've disclosed to somebody in the last 18 months, two and a half years. Because we believe in actually sitting down and having a conversation. I think I've heard from my two colleagues on the left just how important that is. But what we do is, is that we relate this back to the work that we do in schools, that preventative work. Again, always with young people focusing with us on what we need to do next. If it's not right for them, then essentially it's not right for what we need to do. What that's also done though is, is that it's led the service into new directions. So instead of waiting now for clients to be referred in from certain key organisations and certain key places, we proactively outreach to them. We actually go to them and say, look, we want to work with you now before these young people are coming to us with issues and problems. In terms of our treatment model, what we want to do now is, is that we want to sit down and work much more holistically. So again, working with partner agencies, but it's about that young person. We use an link mapping approach. And again, I was talking to somebody earlier on who basically pretty much introduced an link mapping. So again, thanks to them. But plainly and simply, we believe in sitting like this with our clients the way we are sat now. We believe in sitting next to them, not over a table, because we're working together. And people that are working together often don't sit opposite each other, staring at each other, they sit together. So as I say, for me personally, what that's done is it's given us that confidence now to really feel as though we know what we're doing. So to quote Karen, sorry, it's about those trusting collaborative relationships and that, that's the linchpin of what we do. Now what we've done now is, is that we've taken that bit further. The organisation that we work within has asked for a brief alcohol and drug screening tool to be put together. So my initial thought was this is going to be a laugh then because they're going to want a checklist and a tick box and something to kind of like go down and ask lots of questions. And I said no, that, that's not the way that this needs to be done. And they've pretty much demanded now for the best part of 14 to 18 months that unless we follow a building a relationship style and model, it won't work. Thankfully, they seem to have listened and we've been delivering this training now since December. So we've delivered it three times. Well, we say we, it's me that's delivered it three times. And so far, it seems to be working quite well. But one of the reasons why I think that this, this piece of work and us all coming together is so important is to share this and is to shout and scream about this to practitioners that don't work in this way. If we don't build relationships with the individuals that we're working with, if we don't build trust with some of these young people that have never really had opportunities to trust or have trusted and then been let down, realistically we're going to compromise all the work that we're going to do. And again, they may well pay lip service to us, they may well kind of nod and smile in all the right places, but realistically are they actually getting anything out of the work that we're doing together? Um, so as I say, my, my big thing is about building those relationships and I have to say, working along with the EPIC programme is this really absolutely underlined the fact now that unless that relationship is there, the world will, be, will be nowhere near as good as it needs to be. So thank you. Well, does that ring bells with anyone here? Do, are people who are practitioners themselves, I mean, have other people got experiences of trying to engage with young people or operate in a holistic manner that they could um, give us some uh, examples of? Or do you have any specific questions to the panellists? So, uh, anyone who wants to follow up on any of the issues that have been raised? Um, perhaps drawing on your own experience if you if you are working in services. Oh yes, and I was I was not to forget Jason. So I'm going to go. Are you there at the back? Is that right? Yes. Before I, no, but before I forget, I'll come to you and you can say say what you have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Jason, you I'm from Thames Valley, please. I, I, I absolutely um, applaud everything I've heard today. I think it's, it's so refreshing and it's, um, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, however, there's always a however, the role of police is fundamental in this because it's a gateway. Um, the police provide a significant gateway that can undo all of your good work, right before it's even begun. So I think we really need to be um, at the forefront in designing that gateway to your services as holistically and as evidence-based. 
many impedes on academics, many impedes on um, as uh, informed as you are about young people, or adults for that effect, or drugs, or any sort of thing. Um, but they do provide the gateway, and it's that building of an evidence base that is absolutely fundamental. So um, peaks are becoming more and more trauma-informed, and that's a good thing. Um, there are some innovative um, gateways out there, 10 time peaks and diversion scheme, might be one of those that you like, might not be, it, might, it, it needs a critical peer-led review. It is being evidenced, uh, evaluated, I should say, um, but it is providing some interesting results, particularly for young people entering uh, drug education. Um, and I use the word education because there's no arrest, no interview, or no admission to guilt required. So it's um, building that evidence base much wider within the UK and beyond, really, about you know what what does good look like, what does, what actually is diversion, what is the definition. So I think it's coming together, policing, criminal justice, and these services and substance uh, providers to provide that evidence base and actually show uh, what good looks like. So thank you. I've, I've got a demonstration on the screen. If you're here. Is it the case that you can't have therapeutic interventions in the criminal justice system? I mean, would it? I mean, are these two contra completely contradictory? Because I mean, I do remember the days when, long ago, when there were therapeutic communities in prisons. So it was possible in a certain kind of prison with a certain kind of regime to have uh, quite successful therapies. So is it? Are the two completely incompatible? Do we have to talk about diversion? Or does anyone have any examples of uh, working in a criminal justice setting where the more uh, trauma-informed and therapeutic approaches that people have been talking about can operate? Or do they have to, do they have to be in the community? Does anyone have any experience of that? Hi. Um, so we're from... Lincolnshire Prison, so we do run a, um, a program which is called Transform, which we do run across both sites. So we work at HMP Lincoln and HMP North Sea Camp. Um, so we work with a wide range of um, men, really, which vary from um, a local captain remand jail to an open prison as well. So we work with a vast and diverse range of men. Um, so our Transform programme um, looks at um, the men's offending and substance misuse and how that's affected the cells and us around them. So it's a four-week structured programme um, which we look at sort of a range of um, interventions which look at um, personal responsibility, guilt, shame, um, consequential thinking. Um, and we've found, we've been running that for almost believe nearly four or five years now, um, which we do have a really good uptake of the programme. Um, and we also run that into our community um, agencies as well, all over Lincolnshire, which they continue to run that for men who have been released and also people who have never been in prison establishment. Um, so we do get a um, very good uptake of that. Sorry, can I add, so the other thing that we've implemented is that we have a worker who works solely with our service users prior to release to set up these community connections and then works with them on the day of release to take them to their appointments, but then for up to six weeks afterwards to introduce them to and, and hold their hand really as they access the community treatment in, um, in the local area. We can only do this with the prisoners that are released to our own um, Lincolnshire area, so it's really good to be here today to forge some connections with other agencies in other parts of the country so that we can extend at least part of that work. But yet yeah, we are sometimes um, having to struggle to explain what we're doing within the regime, but we're quite lucky at Lincoln, at North Sea Camp, in that um, our governors are quite responsive to what we're doing and supportive. So little by little, we're pushing forward. So it's really good to see what others are doing as well. Thank you very much. Any other experiences? Good. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm 
Uh, afternoon, uh, Raj Ulbi from Change Grow Live. Um, uh, there's been a couple of references to peer support in some of the presentations today. Uh, I'd be really interested to hear from the panel uh, through their work in engaging young people, uh, what the appetite has been like for some of those young people to offer peer support to others who are in a similar position and where there hasn't necessarily been an appetite what you feel some of the challenges and opportunities might be for peer support in that particular setting with that target audience. Okay. Yes? Um, try to, to speak and, and hope that those microphones pick up if they don't, then we'll use this. Oh, yeah. sorry, the measles. Yeah. I think um, with peer support, um, something I think peers, especially you just as it probably really like to support each other, but it'd be kind of, um, uh, I think, one of the main issues, but I think that we've become um, too cautious and too risk averse is kind of giving them the opportunity because we're so concerned about the conflicts between young people, but it is quite difficult to manage. Um, and it's got to a point where there's so much violence between young people that visit the youth justice service that you know you have to show them i don't know like the 12 back exits so they don't meet and if, if someone's in one postcode area they can't meet another postcode area so the challenges of them supporting them each other with similar issues would be affected by but if they lived six doors down the road in the wrong direction and um, their kind of ability to do that or their motives to do that might be kind of questionable or dangerous or risky and then on, kind of on top of that, the issues that you're managing around um, older adults or we have the probation service where we manage the most risky young people, risky, uh, risky older offenders in Sheffield right next to the, the youth justice service. So there's just a lot of issues around them um, supporting each other that need kind of like sensitive negotiation because um, you, are, you are the most credible voice if you have lived through that experience yourself. And whilst we can imagine it um, and we can empathise with it, we, we, we don't have that lived experience. So it's something that we need to, we're trying to work on in our service. Yes, I mean, one of the comments was that um, in one of the presentations that uh, the, the professionals or practitioners working with uh, peer peers worked best. Yeah. On the back of the peer mentoring, it's a long time ago now, but I spent two years working on a home office pilot scheme, working with gang members in Manchester trying to reduce gun death. Um, and it was an amazing scheme, it really, really was, and we were able to do really intense interventions, um, spending time with the family, actually being invited for we go in the backyard when we got out of prison with the whole family and everything. So it was a very different way of working. Um, and we had quite a number of peer mentors that were former gang members. Obviously, we had to be very careful, as you say, which were Doddington and which were Gooch. But we, um, a couple of them had actually been in one of the gang books and was in the No Shut Up football team. So they had a lot of credibility um, but the hoops we had to jump through luckily as it was a home office pilot scheme we were actually we had police officers on the team and a police inspector as well so that made it much easier um, obviously they had to have their convictions um, before they could be used as peer mentors but they were great they were brilliant they, you know, they understood what having their house shot up at you know, in the night and their little kid sister screaming felt like and everything else. So it can be done, but it really does involve close working with the police and just taking an ex-gang member into the local school. Could possibly be friends with them. That was a long time ago I was going to say it was a pilot. It, got, it, that was it. it was a pilot and a one-off, and never, never. They did a documentary on it. Never got those parental calls, and then. And that was the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess that's the key point, isn't it? That actually, we perhaps need to think about how we're evidencing impact and cost-effectiveness, because ultimately, it is the money that often dries out from these pilots or small projects. It, um, in that situation, um, some of the young people that we worked with actually ended up committing a double murder. And unfortunately, when something like that happens, that's what people see, they don't see. Well, they're just uh, prevented. 
this is why you have to. It's best to work with the police, you know. The police have got the power, and then if you're working with the police, you can do all sorts of things, break all sorts of rules, be very flexible, but if you try to do it on your own, you're in trouble. Well, I just wanted to pick up on your question, uh, Suzanne, about whether it's possible to have drug reducing interventions in, in the criminal justice system or in prisons. And we do have that a lot in Denmark, and Cecilia is, is doing great work in one of them. Uh, and I just wanted to pick up on, some, on one of the points that Cecilia was making, that secure, security comes first. And it means that, um, I mean, even though there are drug reducing interventions in prisons, if there are not spaces enough in that prison, some some people are just referred to another prison, taken out of that drug reducing intervention, and so on. If they deliver a, a positive urine tests, they can go into isolation, or they get different kinds of sanctions, and then they can't follow the, the treatment, and so on. So the whole sort of drug control policy in prisons always take precedence over over drug reducing intervention policies. And I think actually it's important to discuss that if we are having uh, drug reducing interventions in prisons. And also how can, how can the prison service and the drug reducing interventions cooperate and how can we sort of prevent that this security first is not uh, sort of what you call that harming the intervention for, for young people or other people that are using those drug reducing can I make a comment on that? Yes. Yeah. In in, uh, in lots of things, we have this uh, special unit for uh, people under the age of 25, and here we have, as a drug counselor, I have a closer collaboration with the officers. Um, so we try to talk about this uh, security all all the time, and we try to, even when they are like. Maybe they uh, give a positive urine test and they get into isolations or they get into a fight and they get into isolations. In, in that unit, it, it, it's actually that I can, I can receive the drug treatment in the cell even though he's in isolation. So we try to work around this all the time. I, I just can't bring him outside to a group or something like that, but I can I can still work with him and we try to talk about that all the time just, just to say that, okay, maybe he, he has given this positive urine test, but that indicates that we have to work with these guys, that indicates that we have to do something, that we have to help them. It shows that there is, uh, that he has this and then just to isolate him from, from, from the treatment, it won't help him. He won't learn just to get isolated. We have to talk about it and work with him. Um, so yeah, we try to do it in Denmark, and yeah, not not it's not always going very well, but we try to do it. Hi, my name is Sebastian. I'm from Poland. I'm a representative of prison system in Poland. I am very familiar with you, which is Lesa, so yeah. Uh, I thought this well, yes, I used to um, walk in down after one of the additional in Poland as a therapist, and I always call in with my director that he has to give me some free will to do something with the patients. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he was always uh, talking about the security regime, and I was still mad at him. And after a few years, I have to admit that we don't have to fight with this way of thinking, uh, of helping people. Of course, um, uh, regime and security regime is very important in the present, and it's obvious. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that we can, can, uh, can't connect uh, it with the health system and with the therapy. Uh, I always try to convince the managers uh, in our presence that uh, uh, the more therapeutic uh, environment he will create, the more uh, help we can offer for the people and the inmates who are in the prison right now. Of course, some the managers that are <coughs> as close-minded, so it's, try, it's very hard to convince them. Some of, the, uh, the, some of them are open-minded, so it's much more easier. Uh, so we try to meet in the halfway, right, the thinking, the less uh, security, the more therapy uh, as, as we can offer. So this is very familiar with this test. Thank you. Karen, you wanted to finish. 
Um, I'm just following on from your comments. Um, I think it's really interesting about the collaboration that you're having um, between prison officers and substance use workers, which you both mentioned. Um, but one of the things when you look at it structurally and where the money gets spent, the, in the UK at least, it might be different in the different countries, the money's always spent on urine testing, on you know um, perimeters, on sniffer dogs. We have you know we have a huge MPS problem in the UK's um, prison system at the moment. You know let's have 300 more sniffer dogs. Let's make the tests more accurate. So it, I think the, that we have to look at, at where these resources are being spent, and it's always the drug treatment that's not not getting resourced. So it's a structural issue, and I think it's interesting that you know you guys are collaborating together and building relationships with one another and. You know, Gunter, you uh, mentioned this morning about sort of to getting these practitioners together and talking about different ideologies, different ways of working. Um, so it's, it's just a comment rather than a question. And, yeah. Okay. Anyone from the panel want to? I just yeah. want to say something. We, earlier we talked about uh, relations to uh, the young persons. Uh, for me, actually, in this with the collaboration, it also depends a lot about the relation to the officers, to what I get through, to what I can do, to what I can, which opportunities I have. So it's not only relations to the, these young people that we work with, it's also relation to all the other persons who are around these young people, actually. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, I think that's a really important point. It's not just a relationship with the person that you're working with, it's a relationship with all the people that surround them as well. And in terms of making referrals and stuff like this, I'm not in a life folks. There's an awful lot of stuff that doesn't quite work, but if you've got a pal on the inside, those are the people that I phone first. Because really, really sometimes to get things moving, you kind of have to go for familial. So in the same way that I'm trying to build relationships with the clients, I think you're absolutely right, you've got to build relationships with those professionals. And I just wanted to think about something that somebody said as well about funding. I think that peer working is absolutely brilliant. And every time there's a piece of peer working, there's always a one to two year funding part, which you know is never going to be extended. So you take these young people, you train them up, you give them all this expertise and experience, and then you essentially drop them because there doesn't seem to be anywhere further else for them to go on to. And again, I just feel as though if we're aware, and I, I don't know about every other European nation that's here, but we're aware in this country now that young men without good male role models are getting themselves into all kinds of bother. I believe this is a European, if not a worldwide issue. If we know that this is an issue, I would be interested in knowing why policymakers aren't actually looking at this as a, as a funding idea and actually starting to get some proper peer mentoring involved, uh, sorry, some peer mentoring for the sorts of young people that we would be talking about in this room realistically, because it's not just one issue that they've got. And we've identified that a number of times today. It seems to be a whole load of issues that are all coming together and to need that holistic approach. So that's just kind of my take on that. We haven't, uh, we've done peer mentoring in some of our uh, approaches, not in our substance use projects so far. Um, we've worked with adult mentors, so there's um, an agency called Aid and Abet in Edinburgh and adult men who have been through the criminal justice system um, and we did a bit of trauma training with them and so they were talking about trauma and the link to uh, fear and, and emotional reaction and how, how that plays a big part in um, criminality, especially in violent crime. Um, so, yeah, and we had a bit of involvement with the police. We tried to use the police to promote our service. Um, so we use a lot of different agencies. We work in partnership with everybody. Um, and so social work, the young people would come. Teachers, the young people would come. But the police, every time the police um, referred a young person, they wouldn't turn up. So there was, we had to sort of look into that a little bit to see why that was. Um, and really it was because it was happening when young people were out in the street drinking. So in Scotland there's quite a lot of that, and probably everywhere there's quite a lot of that happens. Um, and the police were kind of intervening, pouring away the alcohol, giving them a relieflet, and they were just throwing it away. So for us, the police connection wasn't working very well. Um, and we had to look at how we kind of 
take referrals from them in a different way. Perhaps they speak to the school and then the school speaks to us and refers the young person to us because if we were associated with the police, um, the young people just didn't want to connect with us at all. So we had to kind of be quite careful um, there. But we still maintain the, the relationship with the police because obviously they're really key in identifying those young people who are at a lot of risk in the community. Um, but just doing it in a slightly different way, even a little bit deviated from me. So. I was just thinking about this. In terms of peer leadership, I don't want to keep um, mentioning about challenges, but it's about the peer population, like what makes another young person appear, because we were talking about it earlier, there could be like that other in effect, where one young person meets it. Substance use might be another young person who's used substances and think, well, your experience is enough in life, mine, therefore I'm kind of going to switch off and ignore kind of the messages you've got and the outcomes that you kind of want to achieve in me. So it's about, and sometimes um, with like irresponsible recruitment or not the right recruitment, maybe we're looking at the wrong populations of young people to move into those roles who maybe kind of are looking to do it so I want to be a peer.